Welcome to Crime Maze YouTube channel. In this video we are going to talk about the victims of John Wayne Gacy. So before starting this video like this video. And subscribe to Crime Maze channel for future updates. John Wayne Gacy, March 17, 1942, May 10, 1994, was an American serial murderer who murdered 33 adolescents and young men in the 1970s. He was noted for his sociability and his clowning at charity events and children's parties. Gacy grew up in a blue-collar family and had an average upbringing, but his developing sadism led to repeated run-ins with the law in the 1960s. His conviction for sexually assaulting a juvenile boy landed him in the Iowa State Men's Reformatory, Anamosa State Penitentiary, in 1968. After his release in 1970, he was arrested for sexual assault while on parole, but the charges were eventually dismissed. A successful independent contractor, Gacy acquired a home in suburban Chicago. When Gacy's victim Robert Piast went missing in 1978, authorities discovered Gacy was the last person to see him. Police uncovered 29 dead near Gacy's residence and four more in the neighboring Des Plaines River after obtaining a search warrant. Gacy had told his houseguests and his wife that the scent was caused by moisture buildup. The jury rejected Gacy's plea of innocence by reason of insanity, despite the testimony of three experts who classified him as schizophrenic. Gacy murdered 33 young men and boys and buried 26 of them in his house's crawl area. His victims included acquaintances and strangers recruited from Chicago's Greyhound bus station, Bug House Square, or the streets by the promise of a job with PDM, booze, drugs, or sex for money. Others were duped into thinking Gacy backslash, who often wore a sheriff's badge and drove a black Oldsmobile with spotlights backslash, was a cop. Gacy usually had a lone victim, but he often had doubles dash two victims killed in the same evening. In Gacy's home, he would usually bribe a teen with alcohol or drugs to gain his trust. He would then display a magic trick with handcuffs, sometimes as part of a clowning routine. He usually chained his hands behind his back and liberated himself using a key hidden between his fingers. He then volunteered to instruct his prospective victim how to unfasten his shackles. The trick is, you have to have the key, Gacy said, his victim manacled and unable to free himself. Gacy called this method of restraint the handcuff trick. Gacy raped and tortured his hostage after restraint. He frequently sat on or straddled his victim's chest before forcing him to fellate him. After sodomizing his hostage, Gacy tortured him with cigars, made him sit on his back and tug on homemade reins around their necks, and violated him with dildos and prescription bottles. Gacy often manacled his captive's ankles to a 2 by 4 with shackles fastened at each end, a technique inspired by the Houston mass murders. He is also known to have dragged or forced numerous victims into his bathroom, where he partially drowned them in the bathtub before repeatedly reviving them, allowing him to resume his extended assault. When a victim requested to be killed rather than tortured, Gacy would say he would kill them when he wanted to. Gacy usually strangled his victims by tying a rope tourniquet around their necks and tightening it with a hammer. This is the last trick, he told his hostage, referring to the rope trick. He had recited Psalm 23 as he tightened the rope around his victim's neck at least once. In some cases, the victim convulsed four doubles before succumbing to asphyxiation from cloth gags jammed deep into their throats. Except for his final two victims, all were killed between 3 and 6 a.m. Gacy generally buried his victims in the crawl area, where he used quicklime to expedite their decomposition. Some of the victims' bodies were embalmed in his garage before burial. Tim McCoy's Murder Gacy's first homicide was on January 3, 1972. Gacy later claimed that after a family party on January 2, he drove to the Civic Center in the Loop to see an ice sculpture show the next morning. He then drew Timothy Jack McCoy, 16, from the Chicago Greyhound bus terminal into his automobile. McCoy was returning from a Christmas holiday in Michigan to Omaha. Gacy took McCoy on a tour of Chicago before driving him to his house, promising to transport him back to the station in time for his bus. McCoy was once known as the Greyhound bus boy. Gacy said he awoke the next morning to discover McCoy holding a kitchen knife in his bedroom doorway. McCoy raised both arms in a surrender gesture, pushing the knife higher and cutting Gacy's forearm. Gacy yanked McCoy's knife, kicked him against his wardrobe, and walked up to him. A stomach kick from McCoy doubled Gacy. Gacy yanked McCoy, yelling, stupid, I'll slay. He straddled McCoy and stabbed him repeatedly in the chest. After washing the knife in the bathroom, Gacy proceeded to the kitchen and saw an open carton of eggs 
and a slab of unsliced bacon on the kitchen table. McCoy had also arranged the table for two, and had entered Gacy's room to wake him, while holding the kitchen knife. Gacy buried McCoy in his crawl area and eventually concreted over his grave. According to Gacy, he felt completely spent after killing McCoy, but he had a mind-numbing orgasm while stabbing him and listening to his gurgulations and gasping for oxygen. Greyhound Bus Boy Second Murder Gacy said he was killed again in January 1974. Unidentified victim Gacy strangled him and buried him in his closet. His carpet was stained by body fluids leaking from the victim's lips and nostrils. As a result, Gacy routinely inserted cloth rags, the victim's own undergarments, or a sock into their mouths to avoid leaks. Butkovich's murder John Butkovich, 18, a PDM employee from Lombard, vanished on July 31, 1975. Butkovich's automobile was located parked near Sheridan and Lawrence, with his keys still in the ignition. Butkovich had approached Gacy the day before he vanished. A Yugoslav immigrant, Gacy, said he was glad to assist find his son, but saddened that he had gone away. When questioned by the cops, Gacy said Butkovich and two friends had been to his house demanding payment, but they had made a deal and gone. Over the next three years, Butkovich's parents urged authorities to investigate Gacy more thoroughly. Gacy then admitted to meeting Butkovich at the corner of West Lawrence Avenue, waving at him. When Butkovich approached Gacy's car, she said, I want to talk to you. Gacy drove Butkovich to his house, presumably to collect his unpaid salary. Gacy gave Butkovich a drink at his house and then shackled his wrists behind his back. Gacy later admitted Togon away before strangling him. He buried Butkovich's body in his crawl space after storing it in his garage. Instead of digging a drain tile, Gacy buried Butkovich's body under the concrete floor of his toolroom extension garage. Years at Sea 1975, Gacy admits, was the year he increased his sex escapades with young boys. He called these outings cruising. Gacy committed most of his murders between 1976 and 1978, after his divorce. His cruising years he called them later. After his divorce in 1976, Gacy's behavior became erratic, according to several neighbors. This included seeing him with young boys, hearing his car arrive or go early in the morning, or seeing his house lights turn on and off early in the morning. The noises of muffled high-pitched screaming, shouting, and weeping had repeatedly woken one neighbor and her son for several years. The sounds came from a house nearby on West Somerdale Avenue. What do you think about this video? Do let us know down in the comments section below. If you enjoyed this video and want to hear from us again, be sure to hit that subscribe button before you go.